Hello, lads and lasses. You are listening to the Pick 6 Podcast Game Week Edition. Here to start off 2022, we are excited with Jimmy Watkins. I'm Evan Bland with the Omaha World Herald. And it is. It's game week. We're excited that it's here. Nebraska and our esteemed colleague Sam McEwen are over in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we are still on uh, on the domestic side of things here, Jimmy. Um, I, I feel like it's been fun to kind of see everyone settle in over there. I'm a little, little, little green, a little envious about uh, all the fun that they're seeing. But um, you know, what's been your impression of seeing those guys over there in Ireland? Yeah, Sam DM'd us yesterday and was like, wow, I wish you guys were here. You guys got to see this. I'm like, yeah, we wish that too. Um, it's, I don't know, I feel like, I kind of feel like a little bit like uh, the SpongeBob meme where Squidward's stuck in his house and he sees Patrick and SpongeBob running around outside having a jolly good time. I feel that way a little bit. Um, but I, I'm – glass half full. I don't have jet lag and I don't have to hurry back and worry about flight delays and, you know, seven hour layovers or, and what have you. Um, instead I get to deal with, I've been staring at it the whole time during our pre-recording. I get to stare at this disgusting blood blister on the bottom of my foot that I got from playing basketball for three hours last night. So. Okay. That went, I did not expect that. Um, <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, <laughs> We're, we're going to, it'll be a little bit of a shorter podcast today. Uh, we're going to get into the black shirts. We're going to touch on sort of three things that we're looking for in the game Saturday. We're going to throw out an uncommon prediction. I think there's sort of become a consensus about what this season could be. Uh, Jimmy and I are going to zag a little bit where everybody else zigs. And then we're going to give our predictions at the end. But I thought, you know, one, one piece of quality content that we can provide here on the domestic side of things, Jimmy, I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a few uh, Irish jokes that I picked up this oh, week. Boy. These are all, these are all appropriate. <laughs> these are, these are fine. I'm going to give you a handful of these puppies and this is going to set the tone for this overseas week. Do I have to laugh? No, absolutely okay. not. Let's have okay. some awkward silence. That okay. sounds good. <laughs> so this one's this first one uh, <laughs> that I found is less of a joke and, and more of just sort of a bad pun. Did you hear that Ireland is the fastest growing country in Europe? I didn't. Its population is always Dublin. There's a there's another version of that joke from the movie The Hall Pass that mm -hmm. I that I enjoy. Okay. Why shouldn't you iron a four leaf clover? Why? You don't want to press your luck. No, you know that's not terrible. I'm nodding. I'm nodding. Okay, that's not terrible. I acknowledge, and these are clever, of course, as with most of these kinds of jokes. But it yeah. takes it takes a special kind of this. To get me a gig one. <laughs> I've got three more for you. Why can't you borrow money from a leprechaun? Why? They're always a little short. That's true. You know? Yeah. Just as facts right there. What do you call a fake Irish stone? Fake Irish stone. I have no idea. A shamrock. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Total sham. Right. And what's Irish and stays out all night? I don't know. Patio furniture. Patio <laughs> furniture. Yeah. Okay. The, the old furniture that's my, family. That's my favorite. There you go. All right. We'll end it on a strong note there. That's my favorite. All right. <laughs> all right. So Nebraska is overseas. They left Tuesday. They got there uh, by all accounts, slept on the plane. You would hope staying in a gorgeous hotel over there. We'll, I'm sure we'll get a lot of the details from Sam next week but some of the news that came out today they did award nine black shirts like they said that they would do uh once they got settled over in ireland so so nine black shirts we've got caleb tanner garrett nelson uh, ty robinson colton feast luke reimer nick henrich miles farmer quinton newsom and marquise buford Any, anything stand out to you jimmy about that first group of nine uh, Colton Feast stands out a little bit to me. I mean, I think it's not it's not a surprise that he's getting playing time, <clears throat> but it is. I think it's a surprise that he's included in this group, right? Because um, that's just he's, – he's, it's a significant jump for him, and there are um, other able-bodied able guys that I know, I know they're not giving away um, the black shirts to any of the guys who haven't played yet, but, you know, guys like Stephon Wynn, 
Devin Drew. They could have – I would have – I'm not surprised that Colton Fees is going to be playing. I'm not surprised that he's going to be in the mix with those guys. I'm surprised that he's being – I would have expected him to not get a black shirt is, is what I'm saying. Um, the rest of the guys are, are kind of the – the cast and crew that we expected. Um, and one other thing, this is not at all Blackshirt related, but it's sort of Ireland related that I just thought of. Like, it seems to me that our media comrades all have the same sort of itinerary because mm-hmm. I keep seeing pictures from the same spots. Like a bunch of people were at the team hotel. Obviously, I'm sure they're all going on a stadium tour. Um, but that's another thing that I just thought about watching from afar. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. They, they saw the hotel yesterday. Aviva Stadium today it looks gorgeous. Um, you know, as of this recording on Wednesday, they hadn't even put the lines on the field yet. So that's still a work in progress there. Um, you know, the Blackshirt thing, I suppose it can be a little confusing to a casual fan because you kind yeah. of wonder where are some of the bigger names, right? Like where's Oshan Mathis? Um Tommy Hill. And, and so, you know, there's really not a whole lot to it other than the fact that Eric Chenander, the defensive coordinator has said that they don't want to award those to guys who hadn't been in the program previously, that they'll have to earn it on the field. So you would think that, that Mathis, that Stefan Wynn on the line, Tommy Hill would be guys that would get those black shirts eventually. And probably uh, somebody, whoever ends up being that starting nickel as well, whether that's Isaac Gifford or Chris Kalarvik or Javen Wright. So um, sort of a rite of passage to get those black shirts announcements early on over the years. They've come out at different times. Sometimes coaches have used it as a motivational technique to come out later in the year. Some years they only uh, award a handful. Sometimes it's like it's been 15 or 16. It's been a crazy high number. So, um, yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. Would you not agree? Like just the, the guys yeah. that we've heard about. I, in think, um, I just count them. There's nine right now. If we're thinking Mathis, Tommy Hill, um, eventually down the road, or, or maybe Stefan Wynn. Yeah. Devin Drew, four or five more, maybe Gifford. Yeah, I would think that you know, right around 14 or so. Yeah. Probably be what it would be eventually. The black shirts do much for you, Jimmy, like as a guy who didn't grow up um, following Nebraska football. Like it's a cool tradition. It's like, like, so when I, you know, growing up in Ohio, we grew up with like the Buckeye Leafs. It's, it's sort of similar. Those are sort of like things that, that you get added, you get the leaves added to the helmet as you go. But like the, you know, losing your stripes at Ohio State's a big deal. Getting your first leaves kind of a big deal. Um, I don't, I, it's, I like the tradition of, of like a ceremonious announcement of like, you've arrived. That's cool. I do think that the, as the years go on and we get further and further from the, the type of dominant defenses that um, are like that, that spawned that sort of aura around the, the black shirts, it may lose a little bit of luster, um, but who knows? Maybe this is the team that can get back on track towards that uh, trajectory. Last year's defense was, was pretty darn good. Yeah, it was. And, and, I also kind of like the fact that under this regime, it's become more consistently announced at the beginning of the year. I mean, there have been years where you get three, four, five games into the season and you're still kind of waiting and it becomes sort of this distraction or this burden or whatever. So um, there have been, I think, instances in the last 15 years where the, the black shirt tradition has sort of become a hindrance, but it feels to me like under the staff, they've done a good job of, of sort of, giving it its appropriate respect, but at the same time, not overdoing what it is. There's too much That's- in football in general. There's just too much of that coaches dangling the carrot. Like you got, you, you got to keep earning it. You got to keep earning it. It's like at a certain point, like a guy like Garrett Nelson has earned it. So, you know what I mean? Like we don't have to, we don't have to draw things like that out. Yeah, no doubt. Well, let's get into some actual game week talk it's been yeah. a, a long time nebraska northwestern oh, wow. they essentially kick off the college football season here saturday um you know it's the it's the early slot game for for everybody uh, in, in the central time zone certainly um what's uh, let, let's trade it off here give me one thing that you're looking for saturday and, and we'll, we'll bounce a few off each other 
first of all, I just like I know it's week zero. It's a rough slate, man. Like this is to, in my to my eyes the only game worth watching this weekend. Um, I probably will watch a few others just because I'm starved for it. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not great. Um, the first thing I'm watching is intangibles. These the little the little loose screws that needed to be tightened, right? I'm talking penalties. I'm talking the turnover stuff. Um, the play after a mistake, body language. I'm watching that stuff super closely when they can't like, you know, you drop a pass, the camera pans to you. What do you look like? Because to me, this North, the Northwestern game is a culture game. When you're, when you're, when you're up, when you're favored, like Nebraska's favored, it's hovered around two touchdowns for, for most of the time since it's open. Um, and when you're, you're favored by two touchdowns, but here's a little curveball you have to fly across the ocean. I think teams that are wired the way Nebraska was wired last year, and we saw it week zero against Illinois, you can lose those kind of games. You can stumble at those kind of games, or you can look ugly in those kind of games, even if it's a win. If everything that we've heard this offseason from guys like Mickey Joseph and Brian Applewhite, you know, kind of the, the stern-handed um, new position coaches about – you know, changing the approaches in the room, changing the way guys think, you know, all this talk about dog, dog mentality, all that, all that cliche stuff. If that's true, you're going to come in here and take care of business. You're going to win by some somewhere between 10 and, you know, 20 points. I think, I think it should be pretty comfortable when they they outclass Northwestern um, in a lot of areas to my eye. If you're not quite there, well, then <laughs> we're going to continue having some of the same conversations that we've been having. And, you know, that's, that does not bode well for our, for our friend Scott Frost. So that's, that's one, the first thing I'm watching. I'll be watching the entire game. And to me, it's going to tell the story of the entire game. It's just like how, how much tightening can you do during an off season on that sort of stuff? And how much, how much better is Nebraska in those, little intangible areas that are that are hard to define that's what i'm watching that's interesting because it 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 puts out this assumption that's probably true that like northwestern sort of is what it is well well, right but i mean you know they they are what they are they're not they're not an explosive offense they're not a a fantastic defense they're going to be sound so like assuming northwestern kind of has a very small range of outcomes for what it will do. The, 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 the idea that Nebraska is still pretty wide is interesting, right? I think that's, yeah, that's interesting. My first one that I'm looking for is the first quarter. Um, we, we heard Pat Fitzgerald talk about it on Northwestern side saying they have no idea really what Nebraska is going to throw out there. I mean, they've looked at tape of Casey Thompson. They've looked at tape of Trey Palmer. They know they've seen what Mark Whipple has called elsewhere uh, they know what Scott Frost is called but they really have no idea how it all is going to come together and so that first quarter Nebraska has the the, the schematic advantage in the sense in, in the sense that they are, are unrolling sort of an unknown um, sort of operation but at the same time this is a brand new offense in its first drives that count and so what do they look like? Um, it, it'll be really fascinating. I think it, it seems like the first quarter more than usual will be one where you want to avoid mistakes. You want to capitalize if you're Nebraska on the advantage that you have that advantage of the unknown. And if you struggle early on, uh, I think that could be, you know, a, a sign, a kind of a foreboding sign that it might be a bit of a grind on the offensive side of things. So uh, you only have a short window to t- sort of take advantage of that before Northwestern, uh, settles into something and, and, and finds a contingency. They talked a lot about making adjustments at halftime as well. So it's, it really does seem to me like that first quarter, much like they did last year in Lincoln when Nebraska just took off, um, will, will be important in, in sort of setting the tone for this game the rest of the way. Then, yeah, like you said, they know Northwestern doesn't know what Nebraska is doing. Nebraska knows in case top spit it out at the press conference. They know what Northwestern wants to do and to build yeah. off what I was saying about the intangible stuff, um, what, how patient is Nebraska going to be? Like Northwestern can run a lot of zone, going to make you take a lot of five, six yard chunks in the passing game. And 
you know, maybe it, early on this offensive line is going to take some time to gel. How patient are you going to be with the run game? Are you going to, are you going to stick with that for three quarters? Even if you're, even if you're behind, they didn't do it last year against Illinois. They went for, they went for the whole kit and caboodle, you know, mm-hmm. to try and, to try and um, force a comeback in a hurry. So more, more questions about what those slight little tweaks look like. The second thing for me is I'm looking at uh, what I'm going to call secondary job descriptions for, for, for the position groups for like, for example, in the running back room, that's pass protection. Your primary objective as a running back hit holes hard, break tackles, run fast. Right. But on, you know, in the, and where position, when position battles are close, you look at the, the, the smaller things that, that can maybe make a little bit of a difference. Remember last year, Gabe Irvin wasn't named the starter as a true freshman. What did Gabe Irvin do really well? He picked up blitzes really well. And I think coaches, when you have, you can identify something that, okay, I know what you're getting, what I'm getting out of you in this very specific, important situation that helps a lot for wide receivers. It's run blocking for um, the linebackers and some of those edge guys it can be dropping into coverage or for some of those as guys, it could be, how do you play the run? How do you set an edge uh, for the corners? Northwestern is going to run the crap out of the ball. If it can, as often as it can come up and help, you know, Quentin Newsom earned his stripes last year. Immediately. One of the first things guys were talking about Quentin Newsom was, you know, teams are running the ball right at him and he's responding really well. That's a really easy way to earn the respect of your teammates. Now, Marquise Buford's a little bit of an undersized guy, you know, that helps, that helps with leverage, but there's some big dudes running at you. How do you respond to that sort of stuff? Um, Miles Farmer's a taller dude. It's going to be harder for him to get low. How do you respond to a team that runs the ball as often as Northwestern is going to run the ball? Tommy Hill, just a guy we haven't seen yet. That, that Those are the other kind of things. And again, it, it kind of goes back to my original point, just like the nooks and crannies, how, how well prepared are you? How how much have you um, covered everything? That's I just want to see a team because to me that's that's the story of this game. It's the story of the entire season. The reason Nebraska lost nine games last year is not because they lacked talent, skill, whatever. It's because they couldn't do the the little tiny important stuff, the detailed stuff, right? So that's what I'm trying very to watch very closely that sort of stuff Mm. and and some of that will probably be reflected in who the starters are right like we we still don't know for sure who the first running back out there is going to be we still don't know for sure who the three receivers are going to be and so you would think if it's really as close and as deep as the coaches have said that it will come down to some of those secondary things that you mentioned too so um you know not only will they do it in the game, but these are the guys presumably who have been doing it in practice and can it carry over. Uh, my second one is run stopping. How, how does Nebraska do when Northwestern has the ball? They want to run the ball. They have two very good running backs in Evan Hall and Cam Porter. And what does that look like for Nebraska? Because I think I think their pass defense is going to be pretty good with even with replacing three starters in the secondary. I think their pass rush is going to be good. As, as we've talked about before, the, the edge players might be the deepest that Nebraska's had since the Randy Gregory days. And so to me, again, if, if I'm scouting, if I'm another Big Ten offensive coordinator, I, I want to make sure Nebraska can actually stop the run. And, uh, you know, that's going to be good test a test to the transfers you know Devin Drew going from a, a big 12 run stopping to what he'll face in the big 10 same thing with Oshawn Mathis uh Stefan Wynn stepping into a larger role in terms of snaps than he has ever had before so uh, if, if I'm Northwestern or any big 10 West school I'm pounding the ball and so I'll be really fascinated to see how Nebraska's line holds up how does how does Ty Robinson do how does Colton Feast step into a larger role can they um, consistently hold Northwestern to three yards or fewer on some carries and force those passing situations that, that then really put the, the ball in Nebraska's court and puts them in the driver's seat. So I, I think it's important for this game, certainly, but I also think it's important when you look at what the season can become, because the challenge is only going to get bigger when you talk about the Michigans and the Minnesotas and the Wisconsin's and the Iowa's that are going to do all this, you know, to a, to an even higher level 
moving forward, I think this will be a good early sign to see where Nebraska is against the thing that Big Ten offenses want to do more than anything else. Yeah, I was going to say, you know who else is watching that line of scrimmage? P.J. Fleck, Paul Chris. These are, mm-hmm. these are teams that um, ran the ball effectively against Nebraska last year, controlled the clock. That's how, you know, that's that's the book. I think Sam wrote the, a column after the Minnesota game last year. The book is out on how to, how to beat Nebraska. If you can put them in a position where, you know, the you have the clock on your side, you're winning the, the time of possession and they feel like, again, like I just talked about with the Illinois game last year and they feel like they're, you know, they're losing the grip on the game. They're going to rush it. They're going to try and get it all back at once. And that's when they make their, their crucial mistakes. So one way to, one way to shore up that is to make sure that the, the discrepancy in time of possession and the bleeding of the clock doesn't take place in the first place. Right. So to your point, uh, that's a good one. My last uh, field or part of the field that I will be watching, I'll just be watching whoever's landing across uh, from left tackle, Peter Skronsky for Northwestern. It's supposed to be a, a down tackle class in the NFL draft next year, but he is the currently, I think, the number one rated uh, tackle com- that will be coming out last next year, or at least we assume you will. Um, so, Oshawn Mathis, this is why you came to the Big Ten. Let's see what you got against a guy who's going to be a, a high draft pick. Garrett Nelson, we've heard a lot about how much better you've gotten. Let's see it. I like guess the guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I think Chins is going to move these guys around and and let all, each of them get their shot. Caleb Tanner um, is a guy who's always sort of like looked the part, super toolsy. Production hasn't necessarily been there. Again, here's another chance for you to to get off against a, a guy that that's going to be one of the better guys you're going to you're going to go against all season. If you can beat that guy. You can beat anyone on the schedule. You can beat anyone that's going to line up in front of you. Um, and other teams are going to see that too. That's that's almost as important as as the confidence that I would give Nebraska because if, if let's say, you know, three weeks from now, Oklahoma turns on the film from this game and they're seeing O'Shawn Mathis dusting up the number one tackle in the, in the class of 2023 uh, for the NFL draft, <laughs> that's going to be a concern, right? They're going to, they're more likely to commit an extra body or keep a tight end in that they might normally send out on a route, right. Or, or at least chip the guy. So that's another spot that I'm going to be watching extremely closely. I also just like watching high level, big dudes, mixing it up. I think we all like that. So that'll be a fun one to watch Peter Skronsky against person X on the Nebraska, on the Nebraska pass rush. Yeah. And, and it's not always just sacks either, right? Like it's, it's, pressuring the quarterback, making them throw it away earlier. Uh, maybe that forces some sort of an errant pass or turnover. So yeah, there's all sorts of ways those guys can affect things. And and you're right. Like if O'Shawn Mathis goes to the draft and gets drafted next year, you can bet that there's probably going to be a highlight or two from this Northwestern game where he's getting by, you know, somebody else who's going to be in the league. Uh, my last point that I, I'm going to be watching is special teams. Uh, all the things that have, hindered Nebraska and, and both, you know, both obvious and not. So like being automatic inside the 40, I think for Timmy bleak road, what is that like? Is, is that something you have to stress about or is, is it, is it automatic Um, in the punt game, not giving up hidden yards. Um, So it's, it's not just can Brian Buscini, you know, hit a 50 yard bomb and avoid the shanks, but can he place it to where an opponent has to fair catch it or to where, uh, you know, it, it pins somebody on the sideline or something like that. And then on the other side, is there any sort of return game element? I mean, that was essentially non-existent for Nebraska last year. I think they had 27 total return yards or something uh, <laughs> ridiculous. One of the worst in, in uh, FBS uh, college football. So uh, does what does Trey Palmer bring to that? What could right. maybe Anthony Grant or Tommy Hill potentially bring to that? So we have, an, we have a sense that those are sort of the guys in the mix but will Nebraska be a little more bold with that? Um, you know, even something as simple as can they fair catch it on the 25 instead of letting it roll down to the 10? So those are the kind of things that have killed Nebraska for a long time. Can you not only avoid the, the critical kind of meltdown mistakes, but also just the little stuff that plays into the field position? If they can play Northwestern even or be a little ahead in that, then that's obviously significant for this game. But I think it also would be a good sign, um, you know, moving forward into the big 10 where they have elite specialists week in and week out. Oh man. I'm still, I'm not sure that I will, will ever forget. I, I certainly won't soon forget the, 
I'm trying to I'm trying to remember if it was during the same week last year, but there was like a seven day period where we learned that Samori Toure, who was Nebraska's primary punt returner at a, at a certain point last year, had not really done it before and wasn't really sure how to do it. And then uh, Sean Becton told us that I I'm trying to remember if it was Sean Hardy or or Rachel Neville. I'm trying to remember who exactly it was, but one of those younger receivers was doing well in the return game so well that, you know, if he, if, if he was on the trip, if they addressed him, he might be the primary punt return. I'm just, my head is spinning. You can't, you cannot say this information into a microphone. What is happening right now? So, oh yeah, the, the special teams are, are always worth watching. They certainly are special and have been. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, g- give me, give me one uncommon prediction zoom out look at the whole season here for what not not necessarily a record but like something about nebraska that sort of deviates from this idea that okay they're going to go seven and five they're going to be strong on defense like give you know give me something that that from your time interacting with coaches and players your observations maybe that's a little different my my uncommon prediction was going to be the record because i think okay I think I keep all, all you're seeing from, from our, our media brethren is seven and five and four. What's uncommon about my prediction is it's bold. Like let's, let's come on, let's, let's have some oomph to it. I think nine wins are on the table. I think 10 wins is not out of the question. Um, simply because of the schedule, man, like, I, we keep, we've been like conditioned. This is Sam, Sam likes to say when he first hired me, hired me that I, he wanted a different perspective from what the Nebraska uh, media core has. And what I keep noticing is that because Nebraska keeps losing these dumb games to your Illinois, to your Purdue's, to your Minnesota's, that there is an inflated sense of respect for these programs just because you guys keep watching Nebraska blow it in situations where they should be winning these games and teams like, like I just said, Illinois, Minnesota, Northwestern, even in recent years can get along eight, nine Northwestern had a 10 win season, like two years ago, three years ago, just by not screwing up. These are not that good. (laughs) These football teams are not that good. Zoom out. Ohio state's really, really freaking good. They're as good as anyone in the country. Michigan's in that second slash third tier of, of elite college football programs. After that, man, Wisconsin and Iowa are okay. It's, these teams aren't that good. They're not that good. Nebraska is good enough to beat everyone on the schedule except for Michigan. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think nine wins, people in the media, let's be bold. I'm not afraid to have this tape rolled back and look like an idiot in, in 12 weeks. But come on, if you, if you think they're good enough to win seven or eight, don't you think that on the way, like if, if you think they're getting to seven or eight, presumably you think most of those wins are coming at the, the front part of the schedule where it's really, really, really nice. Oklahoma's by far the best team on the schedule. And Stuart Mandel picked Oklahoma to go seven and five this week in the athletic. So if you think that they can build that kind of momentum, that that to, it just doesn't track for me that a team that starts seven and one and builds that kind of confidence is going to fall apart down the stretch in a landslide against the schedule. Michigan's really good. Minnesota at home, like Nebraska's going to be favored in that game if they're six and two, seven and one. Purdue on the road, I'm not a, I, like I think Purdue winning nine games last year was really impressive. They lost like George Karloftis, losing George Karloftis and, and David Bell. Those, those are just two dudes that Purdue is not able to re- replace. You can have, you know, Charlie Jones, the guy they got from uh, from Iowa, who I think is going to be their number one wide receiver. He may well still catch, you know, 60, 70 balls. From 900. It's not going to be David Bell. There is no George Karloftis waiting in the wings for Purdue. When programs like that lose dudes like that, it's different than when than other than programs of higher pedigree lose those kind of dudes. So I think it's just the bar is coming down a little bit. Nebraska has raised its game. And I do believe in what these, these coaches are saying. I believe that Mickey Joseph has straightened out 
the wide receivers room. I believe that Brian Applewhite has straightened out the, the running backs room. You know what you're going to get from those guys. I still have questions about the offensive line because we just, <laughs> our samples don't exist. A lot of these guys have been hurt. We haven't talked. They haven't been saying a lot. So that's my, that's my caution. That's where I worry about this. Worry about nine wins and, and what could come after that. So, but I also think Whipple like is going to build in concepts that make it easier on the offensive line. It's going to be quick pass game, play action. You're going to take stress off those guys. Casey Thompson can make, make all the reads and make the throws that he's going to be asked. And I don't think they're going to ask him to be Superman like they asked Adrian Martinez. The bar's not that high to win nine games. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that this is an, you know, the kind a different a different kind of team. It's it might not even be as talented as last year's team. I just think the bar's lower, man. And I think that our brains have been um, thrown askew by what we've been watching and what Nebraska media has been watching the first four years of Frost tenure. So, so let me make sure I understand you. You're, are you saying that Nebraska should assume or not assume, but should expect to beat the likes of Purdue and Minnesota and Northwestern every year? Yes. Why? Yes, what, what, what makes Nebraska, what separates Nebraska from those schools in a way that they should expect that? Resources. Um, Nebraska invests more in a football program. I mean, the money, the money, money game is becoming even more and more even with the big 10 stuff, but Nebraska has always had a leg up on those programs. And so the, the leg up is it still exists. The gap is closed because everyone's getting a certain kind of money, but Nebraska is going to invest in those programs uh, a little bit differently. I think Nebraska has the infrastructure, better infrastructure, particularly when this new uh, athletic facility goes up. And I think that the tradition, like this is a school that should be, an eight, nine win school every year in Minnesota. And I think by consequence of Nebraska falling out of that sort of zone, schools like Minnesota and Northwestern are sneaking into this picture. Maybe they don't deserve to. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Just by simply steering the boat on course while other schools fail in despair, these schools are getting there. And I think that if, if Nebraska can reach what it's full, I don't think the national championship stuff that may be long gone. We might never see that again, but Nebraska starts steering the boat in a clear direction. Keep going straight, miss the buoys. That's it, this, the ceiling for that program is higher for than, than programs like Minnesota, Northwestern, Illinois, Purdue, whatever. Hmm. I, I would not argue that the ceiling, I mean, I, I would agree with you that I think the ceiling is higher for Nebraska, but I wonder I think you're, you might uh, cause a few fans to fall off the wagon here because I think you're, the, 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 ba- the fan base is sort of starting to understand maybe that like those West peers are a lot harder to beat now than they were 10 years ago. And a lot of that's money. Like you said, like 10 years ago, Nebraska had huge financial advantage because of its fan base. And now with TV money sort of rising, raising the tide for everybody, everybody has sparkling facilities everybody has national tv exposure everybody has all this everybody can pay good coaches who has a more talented football roster nebraska or purdue nebraska nebraska or minnesota Mm, nebraska but not by a lot okay that's that's what i'm saying Talent, talent should win football games it hasn't been and i think yes there has been an uptick in what the mean level school in the big 10 is and particularly in the big 10 west that bar has raised a little bit but because nebraska keeps i'm I'm, for those of you can't see see this on zoom i'm moving my hands along with the bar as i go but because nebraska keeps losing dumb games to these teams that can drive between the lines on the freeway the bar has risen in nebraska circles the respect has gone too far high that's what i'm saying i think we respect these programs too much when the game plan to beat them not that difficult and i think nebraska has better players that's why and i'm talking about for this year specifically these should be the expectations and if they don't meet i'd be fascinated to see and we'll talk about this i'm sure um with sam at several points this season i would be fascinated to see what happens if they do go seven and five eight and four and lose the last two or three of those games, because that to me is not a successful season, even if it's better than what they did last year by a considerable margin. 
Yeah, you're right. And and everyone talks about six and six and how that would sort of be, you know. If they retain them at six and six, I think that's crazy. Crazy. But, but not just that, but but say they go seven and five or eight and four, but they the, the losing streak continues to Iowa and it continues to Wisconsin and they don't uh, stay competitive against Michigan, you know, whatever. Like there, there are paths to even a predicted finish to where it's very unsatisfying. That, that'll be interesting. My, I'll give you mine. My, my uncommon prediction for the season is that the offense will not be significantly better than last year. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's a reflection of Casey Thompson, because I think he's, he's a good quarterback. I don't think it's a reflection even of the skill guys, but a lot of it to me is uncertainty on the offensive line. We, we've kind of heard rumblings of it after a lot of practices this year where the defense has pretty consistently had good days. Um, You know, I I think the offense will curb the turnovers. I think that'll be down and that'll be better, but I just don't know how, how potent they can be. I need to see what that offensive line can do in opening up some lanes for these guys. I need to see what it can do um, holding the pocket and allowing Casey Thompson to operate and do some of the different things. Uh, You know, there's been so much, uh, disruption with that line, with the suspension, with the injuries, with a new uh, assistant coach there. They, I just, I need to see it. I, I, I can't just assume that because they can plug in some of these transfers that they're going to be better. I think they'll still have a few explosive plays the way that the, the offense did last year. Uh, but I just, I don't know if they can sustain the kind of drives that you need to win at the big 10. And then the other piece of it, is I, I just I'm hesitant to see what this Frost Whipple marriage looks mm. like. And we've talked about it before, but it's one thing to say it in the preseason and say this is how it's going to go. It's another thing in these pressure moments, in these critical downs with everything that's at stake, as, as always is for Nebraska, but also with this staff's you know situation, Lincoln on the line, what does that look like? Does the coach ever step in and say, we well, you know we need to do it this way? Or if it goes poorly for a week, do, do changes come? Are there knee-jerk reactions? There's just so many kind of hanging pieces out there that have yet to be resolved. And, and, and certainly winning Saturday would be a nice start in sort of smoothing those waters a little bit. Uh, but I, I just think, again, the idea that you can bring in a bunch of new offensive assistants and transfers, um, and, and patch it together on the line and make it work and, and be significantly better than what it was last year. To me, you're making a lot of assumptions. So I, I just, I, I wonder if this is not going to be sort of 2009 Nebraska ish where the defense is pretty good and you're having to win a lot of low scoring games and relying on special teams and turnovers. And then just hoping the offense doesn't make a big mistake. You're speaking my language on the frost bubble stuff. I think the, 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 um, uh, the dialogue that we've heard from Scott on the, the play calling stuff this offseason has been super freaking weird. The, the the inconsistency that for him at Big Ten Media Day to at least on one occasion correct a reporter to, to say that I'm not, you know, divorced from the offense. He said that when they first hired Whipple, too. Remember he made the – he did, like, the divorced dad analogy or something like that. Like, it was, it's not that he's, he's like, separating from it completely. It's still going to be around. Or maybe I did a divorced dad analogy. I, I forget at this point. I think that was you. But yeah. <laughs> maybe it was a great analogy. Maybe that's why I'm thinking of it. Um, just that stuff is weird, and I feel unsettled by it. And if you want to if you want to just, like, pull the Jenga piece out of my stack, my, the argument, my nine and three stack, that's, that's going to tumble the whole thing down, it is the offensive line. Because – Adrian does deserve some blame. Scott deserves some blame too for how poorly they played last year because they were, you know, they called all these long, long developing plays and Adrian was running around. And again, that mentality of we need to get it all back right now that contributed to that for sure. He was still the most high, the, the highest pressured quarterback in I think it was the country last year by pressure rate. Um, so that, and, and, there haven't been a ton of meaningful changes either. Teddy Prohaska, who looked good in a very small sample size as a true freshman, is back. He should help, should help. But we again, how much do we know about him as a football player? We don't. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just saying he's more of a question mark than we than I think maybe um, the optimists would portray him to be. Bryce Benhart is a guy who got benched last year. He's likely starter, the right tackle. Trent Hickson is a guy who's been 
it, 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 in and out, in and out, starting lineup, really, really just in and out once, but it, it helps me to, to form this take. If I do a little, do a little bit more of that, he's the starting center. I, I just don't know. That's, that's for sure. The unsteadiest part of the line. I will say though, if Scott gives full trust to Whipple, I just think there's some quick passing game stuff that you can use to deter pass rushers, like just getting the ball out fast at the, at the beginning of games can go a long way. I think play action does a lot to help an offensive line, hard play action, under center, turn your body, stick the ball in the running back's gut, play action. We're going to see more of that stuff. Can do a lot to help out an offensive line and a quarterback that, as Teddy Prohaska said during camp, we know where he's going to be. That can do a lot. Casey Thompson is going to get the ball out on time. These are things that you can do to mitigate <clears throat> what I think is, is a clear uh, weakness on the roster. So, hmm. and again, the other teams aren't that good. They're not that good. Expectations should be higher. You know what that sounds a lot like? It sounds a lot like when the staff came to Nebraska in 2018 and said, we're going to, we're going to have quick passes to the side. We're going to go and we're going to maneuver or manipulate our offense in such a way that it that it makes up for a, a line that's so so or unproven. So we'll see. We'll see if if this particular version can fare better than that other version did. Because it's the Big Ten, man. It, it, I think that you can get away with that stuff in the AAC and in in you know the MAC, whatever it might be. I just I wonder how much that's going to translate. Maybe it will. Maybe those guys will settle in and 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 they'll find a way to get it rolling and have an an identity. But they just. I don't know. I don't feel like we've seen it yet. Uh, maybe we'll see it Saturday. Maybe we will. Hey, give, give me your give me your prediction. Oh, we sure as heck. We sure as heck better see it Saturday. I think this is the exact score I predicted last year for Illinois. So that's a great omen. Oh boy. Uh, but I'm gonna say 27-10 Nebraska. Okay. Any any uh, any just specific North, predictions about Northwestern? Them? Northwestern has trouble running the ball. Northwestern has trouble moving the ball. I just have zero confidence in that offense to be able to. I have a lot of trust in Eric Shenander and what he's able to do. Um, I like the talent on that side of the ball. And I think that if Nebraska can even get a field goal on the first two drives and get ahead, there's just going to be such a, such a relief that comes with that. I think they'll settle in and eventually talent's going to wear out. Maybe Trey Palmer catches a bomb. I don't know if Northwestern necessarily has a guy who can run with him. Um, maybe Anthony Grant breaks one. I don't think it's, I don't, this is not going to look like last year's Northwestern game. I don't think this, this is going to inspire some, some irresponsible big 10 West contention takes after this game. I just don't think Northwestern's very good. And I think that Nebraska has tightened up where it needs to tighten up to be able to take advantage of, of bad teams. Yeah. I'm going to go Nebraska. I think it's a little bit higher scoring than that. I'm going to go 38, 17. Uh, I think Nebraska is going to have some explosive plays. I think Palmer will probably have a big game. That's from the man who just crapped all over the offense. Yeah, but I just I think this I think a few explosive plays is a lot different than having to put together a bunch of extended drives. And I think yeah. they can do that in this particular game. I think the defense uh, will force a couple turnovers, and I think the special teams will be sound at least to start. And, and again. <laughs> Like he said, maybe we'll roll this back and wow, how off were we? Because it's yeah. it's it's hard to say. But uh, I think this is a good start for Nebraska on paper. They have a lot more talent. I think they prepared well for this trip in getting there and and did a lot of the little stuff that that may play into it. And it's essentially uh, going to be a home game for Nebraska. I mean, you're talking. I'll be curious to see the final number, but it looks like you're going to have well over ten thousand Husker fans there, maybe fifteen or or beyond. Um, so you would think there's going to be a, a home field advantage in play too. So I think Nebraska can get that thing going early and then Northwestern uh, is not much of a passing team. And so I think if you get behind, things can sort of unravel a bit from there. Yeah. Maybe a turnover too. Um, <laughs> I laughed when I saw Fitzgerald holding that starting quarterback card close to the vest. My guy it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're not feeling good. If you're still, if you're that, if you're that protective of it at this point, you don't feel good about either guy. That's how I look at it. One last quick thing: we're watching this game together, Evan. Are we bringing yeah. snacks? How yeah. many snacks should I bring? <laughs> you know, like any party, you bring something healthy, and then but you also bring something uh, a little more indulgent. So, like you can, 
cater to everybody. I don't know. We'll have to figure out a menu. It's going to be weird. Just anything but but vowels, which is the what <laughs> it provides at home games. So we got to switch that up just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's a good plan. We'll we'll be stuffing our faces with enough vowels over the course of the season. I might I whip up. I make guac. I might make some guac. There you go. Yeah, that sounds good. Well. We will be back next week. We are officially in game mode. Uh, Sam o- o- McEwen will return from <laughs> Ireland, probably jet lagged, um, probably with the glow of somebody who's seen something new and has a lot to share. Ah. So that'll be fun. Uh, we'll, we'll have Sam back next week. Maybe Tom Chattel too. Ooh, we'll, you we'll never, you never know with that guy. You, you may, never know. You may wander in. Uh, but thanks for listening. I hope everybody who is listening enjoys the game this weekend. It's been a long time, long off season. A lot's gone on. Um, hope it hope it brings people joy, and uh, if nothing else, brings people together in some different ways. So stick with us at uh, theworldheraldomaha.com. We'll have plenty of coverage. Sam, of course, is over there, um, and then we're gonna get rolling into the season. Should be a lot of fun. Thanks for listening. For Jimmy, I'm Evan. So long.